Uh, this your boy Juggy. This is my story from my mouth. Where were your early struggles uh, when doing the show, and how did you overcome them? All right. So when I first started interviewing, uh, it was scary, right? So I remember I used to have an a, a emergency question, I called it, and it was, how you like New Orleans? So if I get stuck, I just ask, how you like New Orleans? And that should you know, turn into another conversation. So I never forget we flew to Atlanta uh, to Snoop Dogg's Lalo video shoot, and um, I'm interviewing everybody, you know, P, C, Silk, Soldier Slim, Snoop, and I got to Hype Williams. So I'm interviewing Hype Williams, and I'm talking to him, and I said, "How you like New Orleans?" He's like, "Um, New Orleans." He's like, I like New Orleans. I'm like, oh shit, we in Atlanta. <laughs> so at that point, I'm like, man, you gotta, you gotta work on it. And that was like my second or third time interviewing, and I just got threw in the, thrown in the water and had to swim. So I, I sat down and I thought about what I was good at in high school, and it was English. <clears throat> and I learned that if I set up my interviews like I was writing a paper, where I would do the introduction the thesis, the body, and the conclusion, it helped me to, to where I could interview anybody because it was always going to be different because I'm asking the same questions in a different way. So, you know, it was like, hey, we here, this is who I'm interviewing, kind of like this is what you're going to see today, and, you know, wrap that first segment up. When I go into the next segment, I'm talking about what you're doing now, or where you came from, what you're doing now, and where you're going. And then I conclude, it was simple. And I, I, I think, you know, again, shout out my high school, helped me to be a better interviewer, to be a better organizer, you know, producer, director. Um, shout out Master P, I'm, I'm uh, one of the producers on I Got to Look Up To, and all the movies to come. Um, but uh, I remember, I actually, uh, it got so easy, I remember Jay Tweezy had put together a summer jam, with Max 94.1, and uh, I think I interviewed, it was between 60 and 100 artists, to the point where when I cough, I was coughing up blood. Like, it was, it was crazy, but I had talked that much, and it was hot, and, uh, but I, it was easy. It, I, I could knock them out, boom, 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 and, you know, it was, they were always entertaining, they were always intriguing, and I never made the artist feel like I was attacking them. It was always a friendly, uh, loving conversation to the point where I made a friend every time. Who were the people that doubted you in the beginning? Mm. Or were there any? Man, I could honestly say, you know, everybody have haters. Everybody have, uh, you know, people in their life who are poison or, or always negative. But I definitely feel like a lot of the people I came across in my life, you know, kind of saw something in me the way they felt like. I was gonna make it. Um, now they have, some people probably might have tried to hold me back, but that was because they know they knew that I was capable of you know, going somewhere. Um, so I can't really say it's a lot of people that I felt doubted me, but I can say it's a lot of people that, that encouraged me or knew where I was going, and, and I think it's a lot of people that uh, took part in 
uh, creating who I am today. Um, Name some of those people. So, in the beginning, I don't forget nobody. In the beginning, uh, my my partner Kareem, he was uh, he was the producer with Righteous Records, uh, who was my best friend growing up. Him and a, a dude named Jack and Ramon, and then hanging with Kareem, he was older, so he kind of introduced me to like smoking weed and just like playing on chicks and you know like what your what your big brother's supposed to do, right? So then him rapping for a guy named Tip who had Righteous Records in the in the in the mix of you know learning stuff from Tip, I met all the guys with Fuji gear. So I was selling the Fuji out of my trunk, which was uh, owned by like Bobby Sardi, Mark Souble, it was a guy named Gerald, uh, Big Red, Fred Howard. Uh, uh, There's a lot of guys involved in the success of Fuji gear. And from that point, all of these guys are getting to know me because I'm selling the, selling the clothes. And they're like, man, who this little dude is? to the point where I start hanging around Tip and Suave. And uh, Suave was the CFO for Master P. And Tip was a guy who, you know, hustled and had this record label. And uh, from there, meeting Chris, who owned Fat Fat and all that, to having those guys as like my big brothers uh, to, Evolving to, you know, being with Suave a lot. Suave Bob, shout out to him. Learning a lot from him, do's and don'ts. And, uh, you know, learning from some of his mistakes. Learning from a lot of his successes. Learning how to treat people, you know, if you want to be treated a certain way. Um, just having a, good, a big heart. And then... You know, another guy, Danny Clark, was an NFL player. Another dude, uh, Jawan, was like a big brother to me. Another guy, uh, like Kendrick, like like a lot of these dudes along the way were like big brothers to where I was always popular, but I couldn't, I couldn't get to the bag. I had the popularity, and it's so crazy that Hot Boy, who was with uh you know, rest, rest his soul, P's cousin, hot boy, Jimmy. One day, Jimmy, he said, he said, Jay, he said, man, they love you in jail. Everybody watching you. He said, if I could trade my money for your popularity, I'd do it. I said, we'll be signing up back. Give me the money. You can take it. But, you know, that was my dog, man. But uh, I think that uh, it was people along the way, like, soul <clears throat> to where... I could go to Soul and say, hey, you know, I, I, I need something to wear on the show today. He'll let me, he wouldn't give me no credit. He'll let me wear it on TV and I'll bring it back. But just building with him and just knowing whenever I do touch him, that's why, I, you see, he made this so it's colorful. I could wear any color watch. Let's say Juggy, that's say Juggy, that's say Juggy, my No Limit Tank. You know, I, I, got, so, I got too much jewelry, but you know, you can, uh, you can a diamond will never lose its value. Gold keep going up. Uh, Rolex is up forever. Um, to the point where when I finally got money, I remember my first big purchase. I bought a Soul watch, and he had made, he had created his own watch, and I think I I know I spent five figures on this watch. Over twenty. It was blue and white diamonds, iced out band. And uh, I had a, a, a blue and white piece, blue and white ring, and uh, I was happy because I was able to now spend, spend, you know, spend it back with somebody who believed in me. Right. Right. Um, my barber Jamal, I always had a fresh haircut to where I was always TV ready. Uh, a couple of clothing store owners, you know, I shouted them out. They kept me fresh. When I got money, I was like. It's a lot of people that believe in me to the point where they helped me to always stand tall and be ready. 
And a lot of the artists I'm interviewing, they're like, she, you look like you the artist. Your jewelry shining harder than mine. My partner, AG, he always made my grills. Uh, he was from Kansas City. And I mean, you know, it's a, it's a lot, a ton of people, man, who played an intricate role in, in my life. That I, I'm, I'm thankful to God for even allowing them to cross my path, you know, and, uh, and the road to, 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 to be who I am today. It's your boy Juggy. We all have a story to tell and a lesson to learn. This is my story.